So I would like to provide you with an example of some glacial facies and I want to take you to Greenland and in particular uh, this area that I got to go to uh, last year that has uh, some very old rocks and uh, it's an area called Isua um, but I also had the opportunity to observe a lot of glacial facies. So I'm going to show you uh, photos uh, from right in this area at the edge of the ice cap, uh, plus some photos we took from the helicopter as we uh, flew to and from Nook to this area. Okay, so this is a view of the ice cap uh, from the helicopter, and um, out in the distance here, you're looking into the interior of Greenland, uh, this is the ice and it's uh, flowing over some rocks and it's got all these crevasses in it um, from the strain. The brown color is uh, from rock and debris and this is the edge of the glacier that's melting back and this area is a moraine, be a lateral moraine uh, that is composed of, of diamictite. So we can also look at the um, ice cap end on and so the ice cap again is at the horizon here and the ice is uh, spilling over this area. Parts of it are scoured bedrock as shown here and then parts of it are moraine, these, these grayer areas here and you can see the debris in the ice sheet. So the next image shows a, a closer up view right here and you can see that there's a lot of there's a lot of debris in the ice itself and as the ice melts it leaves that behind and it's piled up in this lateral moraine because it's at the edge of the ice on top of bedrock and there's a a lot of uh, debris here as well and the front of the the glacier and the ice sheet is um, on this lake and you can see a few small uh, icebergs in in the area there and so the icebergs um, break off we often say calve off the front of the glacier and then once they're floating in the water um, they continue to melt. So the next photo is going to show um, an area that's off to the uh, left side of the screen here And this is an area where the, the glacier is melting, but it's not melting directly into the lake. And so the, it's depositing a lot of sediment and the liquid water is flowing out and forming this braided river. And the braided river is, is sorting out some of those uh, sediments. And you can see that the topography and organization of that depositional environment is significantly different than the moraine, which is just the debris released from the laminar flow. So here's a, a, another view that's a little bit uh, to the north and west. Again, the ice cap is at the horizon, and there's a lateral moraine coming down here. The front of the ice used to be out at this area in here, but it is melted back. This area is melting um, very quickly. And it has these areas with ponds in it here, and there are all these, these ridges, each represent a time when the ice probably uh, flowed to that point and maybe pushed some sediment ahead of it uh, and left a ridge of debris and then melted back. One of the things I like about this image is it shows again water, melt water coming down in through here in a braided river. And, and it's flowing into the lake and it's creating this large delta. And that delta, it was just like any delta going into a lake. Uh, it's, it's building outward and all of the, a lot of the sediment is accumulating right at the front here. So both when you have a delta from a braided river flowing into a lake and when you have a debris coming in directly from the glaciers can end up with a particularly steep slope 
um, off the side of the delta, uh, so for example in here, and you can get uh, turbidites coming off because the slope is so high that it fails and then you end up with the sediment getting uh, deposited uh, further down slope. I mentioned earlier that uh, the glaciers uh, calve and form icebergs and so here is an example of one uh, that shows a significant amount of sediment. And so it's floating over uh, the water which has a very low flow speed and, and the fine grain sediment uh, will just settle from suspension but as the iceberg melts it drops the sediment irrespective of the grain size down into the bottom of the lake creating uh, lone stones or drop stones. The other thing you can see here are these brownish areas represent parts of the water that have a lot of rock flour and that's that uh, mud sized uh, lithic class that come from grinding up of the rock um, in the glaciers and so most of the sediment uh, below this area will consist of that rock flour that settled out from suspension but it will have these larger class from the melting of the icebergs. So if we go back to the till deposits, this is looking down from a helicopter and we have a couple of people here for scale and there are large parts of this that are outcrop but a lot of these, all of these boulders that I'm like putting uh, dots in here different types, uh, there's one over here over here, these were all dropped by the ice as it melted back and so when the ice is just straight melting back, you end up with this huge mix of sediment, different sizes, uh, different shapes, um, and a, uh, just a, a jumble of, uh, of grains that would form a diamigtite if it's turned into rock. Now there's a difference in this upper part of the image here. Above the line, you note that the rocks look much more closely fitted together and you're seeing mostly large rocks whereas here it looks like there's a lot of dirt in between. The difference is that this part has actually experienced some of that melt water flow over it and the very fine particles that get deposited by the glacier just staying in place were actually washed away here and the next picture will show that those boulders also have some rounding to them. So this is looking in the same valley but uh, looking along it and from the ground and what, what the sediments are really showing is that they have a more uniform grain size. There, there are still some uh, much larger boulders um, and then there's some plants have established in this zone here but the rocks are uh, relatively rounded um, I guess I should probably say they're subangular. A few are very angular. Um, but this, this uh, rounding relative to the very angular rocks is evidence that these were um, exposed to transport in, in a river system um, uh, sometime in the past. So the reworking by water both sorts the grains uh, at least to some degree and it rounds the grains at least to some degree. Another feature that's very characteristic of glacial deposits uh, or processes is the development of pavements. So there's a mechanical pencil here for scale and this, uh, pay, this surface here is a smooth pavement uh, from the glacial erosion. Now it's, it's formed on a schist which had a fabric to it already and so some of these color variations in here are related to the actual fabric of the rock but the next image I'll show that some of these ones that are going uh, diagonal and some of the ones that are sort of parallel to the schistosity are actually carved into the rock by the glacial flow. Uh, so here's that uh, close-up of that same surface again with a pencil for scale and you can see the scratch marks running along here and each one of those represents 
a place where a rock inside the glacial flow uh, was scraping against the bedrock, smoothing the bedrock and uh, the class that was in the ice. So these very big um, zones in here are actually called uh, chatter marks. And they're from the interaction of very large rocks with the, um, the, the surface uh, below the ice. So we talked a little bit about the rock flower and suspended sediment, and I wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about that. So um, all of the tan area in here is meltwater uh, directly from the ice cap, and it has a very high proportion of uh, that uh, mud-sized rock flower. And in contrast, this, is, this island is bedrock, and there's a lake of accumulated snow melt um, on that. And, and so this isn't fed by the glacial melt itself. This is, just has some uh, windblown fine sediment, but this is what the water would look like if it wasn't being fed by as much um, uh, rock flour as you get with the melting glaciers. And that water with all the rock flour flows downstream and it, this is a river that's uh, flowing off to the, to the left and it has this milky um, look to it because of all that suspended sediment. So the rivers can uh, move all grains um, smaller than I think these are boulder size. This was taken from the helicopter so it's a little hard to tell. Uh, but it can, uh, when the, high, the flow is high, it can move these large grains, and all, and when the flow is as it is now, or f flowing much at all, it can it can transport the rock flower. So downstream, eventually, these rivers flow into uh, fjords or or flooded valleys from the marine water. And this is uh, an inner tidal zone at low tide. And a lot of that rock flour has accumulated um, on these mud flats. And so one of the interesting things um, th is that, that usually mud flats have a lot of mud, but it's composed of clay minerals. In this case, because it's being fed mostly by melting of the Greenland ice cap, with glacial processes, it has mud-sized grains, but they're mostly composed of, of uh, lithic fragments that aren't chemically weathered. And icebergs can get out uh, into that zone and that far. I actually saw some that were grounded on, on the intertidal flats, and so even in marine waters they can melt and uh, release uh, some of the sediment like you see here. Hey, well, thanks for watching.